Hi, David Harper of Bonic Turtle with a quick illustration of how to value a credit default swap. This is especially from FRM candidate customers, and I'm using the example, the numbers, exactly as they appear in John Hull. That's Chapter 21, Section 21.3. In order to value the CDS, we need a few assumptions. We really only need three. I have the notional of a 1,000 in here, but I don't really use it. Then we have a risk-free rate of 5%. A probability default of 2%, let's remember what that means. The protection buyer, that's the CDS buyer, is paying for protection on an underlying reference credit sensitive asset or reference obligation. This is the marginal probability of default on that underlying reference that the protection buyer does not need to own. So we're assuming that each year there's a 2% chance that underlying reference will default. We also have an assumption about recovery because we assume there's going to be a post-default recovery of some sort. Here it's 40%, and for FRM candidates, recall that means a 40% recovery implies a conditional loss given default of 60% or 1 minus 40%. So before I just quickly go through the spreadsheet that mimics the John Hall example, just two points. First, what we're doing here when we say credit default swap valuation, in this context, context, what we mean is we're solving for the CDS spread. That's the insurance payment made by this counterparty to the other counterparty in the bilateral contract. That's what we're solving for, the spread that is some percentage or some basis points as a multiple of the notional or principal. The second point is... This exercise has typically been difficult for new learners, but I think it helps to keep in mind what we're doing before we get into the weeds. We're applying some basic building blocks here. All we're really doing is considering that these counterparties will come together. Uh, This CDS seller will sell protection to the buyer really only if it's a fair deal, and that means that the present value or probability-adjusted present value of expected payments made by the protection buyer need to equal the probability adjusted present value of the expected payoff made by the CDS seller. Really, we're just solving for both sides of these such that on a present value, they have a fair deal and so they are equal. The only difference really here is in the dynamics of this. The protection buyer is making virtually certain insurance payments, that is to say in the model on an annual basis, but more in practice, maybe quarterly, we, this this counterparty is going to be making those low payments, but they are virtually certain. On the other hand, the CDS seller is in the opposite position. They're they're very it's very unlikely they're going to be making the payoff. After all, the reference has to default. So this is a highly unlikely payoff, but it'll be very large. So high probability of low payments need to equal low probability of high payoff. Otherwise, the math is really the same. So if we look here on the left, I've got the, this is this all goes to compute the present value of the expected payments by the CDS buyer. So this is, assumes a five-year credit default swap broken into six-month intervals. So here, at the end of the first year, we have discount factors. The purpose of those is to convert these future value payments or payoffs into present value. We want to, at the end of the, at the bottom, we get everything into present value terms. So here on the payment side, we have the probability of survival. Because the probability of default was 2%, that means there's a 98% chance that the reference survives through the end of the first year. And then there's a 96% chance that it survived into the second year. This is a cumulative probability of survival. If it survives, the CDS buyer will certainly be making the payment. So this 98% multiplied by whatever that spread is, the insurance payment, is going to be the expected um, payment by the CDS buyer. And this gets, in this column, converted into present value terms by multiplying by the discount factor. So here what we have is we've done two things. We've probability adjusted, so we get the expected payment, and we've discounted to the present value. And we do that for each of the five years, such that if the if the uh, reference were to survive five years, 
then this is the present value of the expected payments made by the CDS buyer. In fact, it's not even the if. It is the present value of expected payments because it includes the probabilities that the reference survives. The only other tricky thing about this is we do need to add expected accruals because this doesn't cover all scenarios. This is the scenario where the reference doesn't default. If the reference defaults, the other assumption John makes, this is a simplifying assumption, is that the um, buyer, that is that default happens six months into the year at the mid-year mark. If there is a default, then the buyer is going to owe the seller an accrual, just the accrued portion of that year's premium payment. And so in this case, we're multiplying the 2% by 0.5 because there's a 2% chance of a default, but the buyer is only going to accrue half of that. And so similarly here, we are present valuing to compute the present value expected payment if there is a default. And now that we've added that to the present value of expected payments, if there's no default, we've considered all scenarios on a probability adjusted basis for the CDS buyer. Similarly, we do this for the seller, but we only need to consider the one scenario because there, if there is no default, the seller has, has makes no payments. So that's why there's only one scenario on this side. The only scenario the seller cares about is if there's a default. And similarly, we're looking at probabilities. In the first year, there's a 2% chance probability of default. In the second year, there's a 1.9% marginal probability of default. That's because this is the probability that the reference survives the first year multiplied by the marginal probability of default in the second year. So we have the probabilities that these event happens. Then we have the discount factors again because we're going to convert to present value terms. Then we, this is the pay, payoff portion. This time it's percent of notional. And you can see it's one minus the recovery because we're talking about the loss. So in this case, it's going to be 2% times the loss given default. That's the percent of notional that will be owed by the CDS seller, which is converted into present value terms. We do this again for each of the five years and we end up with the present value of the expected payoff by the CDS seller. As it is shown, that is per $1 of notional. So we could multiply this by the notional to get the dollar amount. Now that we've done that, if I move down just a little bit, we're really ready to solve because what we've done here is we've calculated the present value of the expected payoff made by the seller is equal to the present value of the expected payments made by the buyer. And then it becomes a matter of solving for the spread that sets those, e sets those to be equal to each other. Here's the expected payments made by the CDS buyer. That's this piece here and this piece here for the accrual. They total a 4.113 times the spread is equal to the expected payoff made by the CDS seller. That's 0 0.051 per $1 of principal or notional. And so here's the key. The expected payments made by the CDS buyer need to equal the expected payoff by the seller. And in this case, that means 4.113 times the spread needs to equal 0 0.051. That means we can solve for S. So in this case, that ends up being 0 0.0124 or 124 basis points. So 124 basis is the insurance payment or the spread multiplied by the notional that under all of these assumptions ensures that the expected payment made by the CDS buyer is going to equal the expected payoff made by the CDS seller. So that's the logic of uh, this, this uh, application in John Hull. This is David Harbour, The Bionic Turtle. Thanks for your time.